The Church of England was separated from the rest of the Catholic Church in 1534, and in 1571, the 39 Articles which define Anglican doctrine were finalized and added to the Book of Common Prayer. But it was not into a spirit of fervent religious practice that John Wesley, born 130 years later in 1703, found himself in, but rather one of infidels and apathy. Nine years before Wesley, Voltaire was born, soon to spread his criticism of religion. And eight years after Wesley, Hume would follow with his skepticism. But it wasn't just from the outside of the church that John Wesley would see a rejection of that which was holy. The Archbishop of Canterbury in the Church of England, during much of Wesley's ministry, Thomas Secker, spoke of the state of the church in this way. Christianity is ridiculed and railed at with very little reserve, and the teachers of it without any at all. By the time Wesley arrived at Oxford University, he found posted in the university a directive prohibiting the reading of the infidels' books and encouraging the reading of scripture. Even then, Oxford was no friend to an enthusiastic Christian. The Dean of Christ Church, one of the Oxford colleges, refused to post the edict, and when John Wesley, his brother Charles, George Whitfield, and others formed the Holy Club, where they would encourage each other in Christian living, reading the Bible, and study together, the rest of the university would sneer at them when they would be seen walking at the university. In 1735, John and Charles Wesley together left England to go as missionaries to the native tribes in the Georgia colony. On the journey over, John Wesley was impressed by the heartfelt faith of a group of Moravian Christians who were on the voyage. One asked him if he had personally been saved by Christ, and in the moment, John was hesitant in his answer. This moment would return to his thoughts frequently in the years to come. For two years, the Wesleys attempted their evangelistic work among the natives before Charles left, disappointed from the complete failure to gain any converts. John soon followed him back to England. On the voyage back, John questioned his own faith. In his journal, he wrote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? It is now two years and almost four months since I left my native country in order to teach the Georgian Indians the nature of Christianity. But what have I learned myself in the meantime? Why, what I the least of all suspected, that I who went to America to convert others was never myself converted to God. In England, Wesley sought out the Moravians, recalling the faith he had seen from them on his journey to Georgia. He met Moravian missionary Peter Bowler, who convinced him that an extemporaneous prayer of faith was not incompatible with holding still to the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, and in May of 1738, Wesley experienced conversion, a moment of faith that was at the time a major emphasis of Moravian Christianity. In other occasions, both George Whitfield and John's brother Charles, too, had this experience. At Oxford, the Holy Club had been given, due to their methodical practice of Christianity, the title Methodists. And though the name was derogatory in intention, Wesley had embraced it. One of the Holy Club, George Whitfield, was at this time now preaching a lively Christianity throughout England. Whitfield was an Anglican cleric and had no intentions of participating in the forming of a new denomination, but the liturgical nature of the churches left no opportunity for Methodist fellowship and teaching within the church services, so separate societies were founded for these Bible studies and meetings of those in the movement of Methodism. Wesley, too, though not as skilled an orator as Whitfield, preached throughout the countryside. In 1739, the first Methodist chapel was built, not as a competitor to the local Anglican parish, but as a complement to it. Before long, Wesley and Whitfield were preaching throughout America, and the evangelistic fervor and preaching of a one-time salvation experience produced such an influence across all denominations that it has come to be known as the First Great Awakening. During Wesley's life, Methodism in England did not replace allegiance to the Anglican Church, but did produce a new brand of evangelical Anglicans that has remained even to the present. In the American colonies, things were different. Wesley's preaching split apart Congregational and Presbyterian churches, resistant to the new theology, and Methodist churches were started. With a shortage of Anglican priests to minister to these churches, Wesley, a strong proponent of frequent communion, decided to ordain ministers to administer the sacraments. This went against the Anglican view of bishops holding the authority to ordain. Shortly after Wesley's death, most who attended the Methodist chapel services in England had stopped attending the Anglican churches, and in 1795, as the Methodists morphed into a separate denomination, known Methodists were excluded by the Church of England, formalizing the split into two denominations. Is there any chance of these two groups reuniting? Today, Methodism is divided into many denominations, some under the title of Methodist and others called Wesleyan. 
Anglicanism too, though mostly concentrated in denominations within the fold of the Anglican Communion, does have additional groups, such as the ACNA in the United States. So the idea of all these groups merging together is unlikely. However, in the United States, the largest Anglican body, the Episcopal Church, and the largest Methodist body, though it looks like they may be splitting themselves soon, the United Methodist Church, are working toward a full communion agreement, which allows the denominations to exchange clergy, and means that the administration of the Eucharist and baptism of the other is recognized as valid, among other agreements. In May 9 of 2019, the UMC Council of Bishops unanimously voted to bring to the General Conference the question of full communion with the Episcopal Church. Later this year at the 2020 General Conference, it will go to a vote where, if approved, the Episcopal Church will then take up the question in July of 2021.